To this day, most people think of climate solutions very technically and individually. Use solar panels or wind turbines, reduce how much meat we eat, drive our cars less, and so forth. While it's true that addressing the climate crisis will require societies to drastically lower emissions and get CO2 out of the atmosphere, it's not the full picture. We think of climate change more often as what needs to be done rather than who can do the work. This is what climate justice activists focus on, the very real people like me and you that have not been the center of attention for quite some time in the mainstream environmental movement. But how could it be about people and about carbon? I'm glad you asked. Answering this question gives us a unique win-win situation. My name is Isaias Hernandez and this is Queer Brown Vegan. My platform is to bring you environmental education that's focusing on intersectional issues rather than ignoring them. If you like what you see here, be sure to like, comment and subscribe because it helps me grow my channel and bring you more educational content. Climate change didn't just come from nowhere, it's also not like a meteor coming from space to destroy our planet. Climate change comes from us. It is made possible due to the centuries of exploitation, primarily of people that earn the least and driven by people who earn the most. It only takes a second to think about. Do you have something in your neighborhood that is producing energy but causing widespread pollution? If not, that's simply because it has been placed elsewhere. A prominent environmental justice researcher named Dr. Robert Bullard has found in his research that the biggest determinant of someone's health is their zip code, the environment they live in. This is where we get terms like environmental racism from that examine where these polluting facilities get put and who lives in those environments. These people, often black, brown, or poor, are closest to the problem, which also means they tend to be closest to the solutions. Black, brown, and indigenous communities across the US and the world have already shown and how we can tackle carbon emissions and build a more just society at the same time. Luckily for us, it's all linked. For many of these people, it's not a notion of saving the world or controlling people as climate skeptics like to say. In truth, these people act in self-defense and their solutions reveal truths and solutions for our communities that face the same harms. While we can all sit back and read articles about global warming, renewable energy, and the very abstract but scientific elements of this crisis, climate justice asks us to see how people can be their own leaders and inform decision making for their community. For example, if you were a lower income person living in San Francisco during 1991, there is a decent chance that you were drinking lead in your water. Now, no one wants that. Now, does lead in your water cause climate change? Of course not. But if it's causing harm to your community, leading to an expensive medical bills, when you already don't have money to spare, it becomes much more difficult to focus on other issues. What we can't do in these situations is wait around for the government to solve things. That was the logic leading to the foundation of people organizing to demand environmental and economic rights, aka Poder, the organization. This group has since been gone to actively resist gentrification, and the thing is, since this group harnessed the power of the people and set to work bothering the city, it worked. And it worked quite well. Something amazing happens when you harness community power, you get things that are good for the community, not just for making profits for someone else, but revitalizing the community culture that exists. One particularly notable feat was getting an old parking lot turned into affordable housing that is a fossil fuel free, all electric green building and has features like a rooftop garden. And these are some of the amazing initiatives that I really love to see in my own neighborhood. Another example is Native Renewables, which provides solar power to Navajo and Hopi homes where so many have been kept in dark even though their lands provide electricity for big cities but now they are leading the way for energy independence and if we follow their lead we could have all have cheaper electric bills and perhaps save life on earth along the way. Solutions are just more effective if they are led by communities who know what works and what doesn't. If communities have a say, then they can make sure that the choices are more effective and tackle other issues at the same time. 
It's a win-win. Climate justice solutions are not just about a magic wand trying to fix climate, but recognizes that the real work of putting people and communities in charge and can create powerful results that can then inspire similar changes in other places worldwide. Don't give up because we have the solutions and we know what works. This video was made in collaboration with The Solutions Project. The Solutions Project envisions a world that is driven by purpose and one that combines and amplifies racial ideas and hard work from those whose voices typically might go unheard. The Solutions Project uses its culture platform to connect with leaders, innovators, and solutionaries to a greater collective, and they leverage celebrity voices to amplify the voices of the rest of us, creating cultural momentum to empower our work. I have personally worked a lot with the CEO, Gloria Walton, who has been a climate justice activist for decades and the work that she continues to do in the philanthropy space um, to fund climate solution is remarkable and this is why I encourage you all to consider supporting the Solutions Project and the work that they continue to do. Thanks for watching and be sure to like the video, leave a comment with something that you learned or topics you'd like for me to explore and subscribe to the channel if you like what you saw.